So we gathered here for Resurrection Sunday, and uh, just a, an amazing event in the Christian calendar, probably the most important day in the Christian calendar um, every year. And uh, really trusting and hoping uh, that this service and the opportunity that we have to worship will touch all of our hearts and enable us to remember and to consider and to be caught up in the wonder of the story of Jesus' death and resurrection and uh, his meaning of that for our lives. If it's true, and I believe it is, then the resurrection literally is the most important event in human history. Not just for the Christian faith, but for every human being if Jesus truly rose from the dead. If there was no resurrection, then we'd literally be wasting our time here. There'd be no point in coming to gather, sing songs, worshiping a person that's dead, that's just a, a moral teacher, just like any other moral teacher that's lived in history, just like some other influential historical figure. If that's all Jesus was, there's no point in us meeting like this. If there's no resurrection, if Jesus didn't come and rise from the dead, um, then all we have is like a, a moral system, a value system that's maybe good for society, but we don't have all the benefits of salvation that we believe we do because Jesus rose from the dead. There'd be no forgiveness of sin. There'd be no reconciliation with God, no peace with God. We'd live with that sense of anxiety, that sense of separation, like, does God really love me? Do I even know God? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, there'd be no power at work in our lives, the offer of a new life, the offer of hope. We'd just be uh, wasting our time, if you like, wasting our breath in this brief life that we have. If there's no resurrection from the dead, there's no justice all the evil people that live in the world and all the wickedness they do and all the suffering that results of that, we all just die and just go back into the dust and no one's held accountable for their actions. There's no hope of justice. There's no hope of a better life, of a life of pure um, absence of evil, of absence of sickness, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. The scriptures tell us that about 500 people saw the risen Lord Jesus. Paul wrote that in his letter to the church in Corinth. It was about AD 55, about 20 years after Jesus rose. And he said in that letter that many of those people were still alive to that day. It means that this message of Jesus that spread out of Jerusalem and touched the whole of the known world wasn't just a message where some small group of preachers got up and, got up and said, well, just take our word for it. You have to believe it because we're telling you that's the way it is. He's saying there's 500 witnesses that have seen the risen Lord Jesus. Some of them are alive today. You can travel from your city in Corinth. You can go and talk to one of those people that witnessed the risen Lord Jesus rise from the dead. Don't take my word from it. There are eyewitnesses that can testify Jesus is alive. For me, probably one of the most powerful evidences that I see as I read through the scriptures is the, the literal change in personality of the disciples. I mean, when Jesus was crucified, they were running for their lives. And not many of them were hanging around the cross. And even the one that hung around by the trial, Peter, he was one that was kind of denying he even knew Jesus. They were fearful for their lives. Straight after the crucifixion, disciples were scattering out of Jerusalem, walking towards Emmaus, another city. They had given up their hope. They were on their way out of there. But when Jesus rose from the dead, there's this attraction. They all start to gather back again in Jerusalem. They begin to have these encounters where he's appearing to them and teaching and speaking and ministering. And then when he pours out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, we have this rabid group of disciples, no longer running for their lives, no longer fearful, no longer doubting is what we believed really true. They give their whole lives for the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. Most of them are martyred, those early disciples, as they continue to hold on and refuse to deny their faith in the risen Lord Jesus. He rose from the dead. But today, I don't really want to focus on the large number of witnesses, the, the mass evidence, if you like. There are three particular stories that I want to focus on in the scriptures, people that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. Their encounters, they're actually deeply personal. In some way, it's a little surprising because this risen Lord Jesus, who is now kind of evident to be God, who's worthy of the worship of every created being and thousands and millions of angels will be bowing before him shortly in heaven. You wouldn't think, why would he stoop to have a few personal encounters with a few individuals that maybe seem troubled along the way, but that's what he does. The risen Lord Jesus, who deserves every knee to suddenly just bow and fall at his feet, 
goes to find a few troubled individuals and reveals to them who he is. Let's have a look. John chapter 20, verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Women in the days of Jesus had fewer rights than men, fewer privileges, a lower status in society. It's unusual that Jesus would choose the very first person he appeared to, to be a woman in that culture and in that time. If we take the story of Mary Magdalene, she had some troubled history. It's not like she was, you know, kind of a a model woman, if you like, a premier woman in society that everyone looked up to. She had seven demons cast out of her. She had a troubled past. She she had this, this history to her life that didn't make her like an elevated person in the society in which they lived. And it's incredible that Jesus would stoop, as it were, and come into that garden for Mary Magdalene, who was desperate to find his body and to reveal himself to her as a person of lower status in society than we would have expected. And it's as though he's, he's speaking in his appearance to Mary, saying, look, you're not defined by your status in society. You're not defined by the the emphasis that social kind of values put on you. You're not defined by your history. You're not defined by your demonic past. You're not defined by your troubled history. You're not defined by how much people do or don't despise you. You're defined by your faith. And he appears to her and says to her, Mary, I am going to my God and your God. To my father and your father. And he lifts her status to one in which she's perfectly affirmed by the risen Lord Jesus Christ. It's not only that he lifts her status by appearing to, but he actually gives her a task. A task to go and tell the others what you've heard and seen. Go and tell them I'm alive. And so Mary is lifted out of her social status by an appearance of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. The next example is a few verses on. It's Thomas. Verse 24, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to my Lord and my God, then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who've not seen and yet have believed. Doubting Thomas as we've come to know him because of his absolute refusal to believe the testimony of the other disciples. I won't believe until I see him and I put my hands in his flesh. It's not that Thomas was kind of one of the most well-known disciples or one of the most influential. Thomas wasn't the one that walked on water. He's not kind of the one that everyone is waiting for. Well, if Thomas like, puts his faith in Jesus, then we know everything's been okay. He's got little, there's little about Thomas in the gospel stories. You don't know much about him, but one or two occasions where he appears, he, he can seem to have a, a slightly defeatist attitude. He, he comes to mind when he's uh, talking to Jesus and the disciples when they are going to back to see Lazarus. Lazarus was sick and died, and uh, Jesus eventually says, okay, we're going back uh, to Judea. 
And the other disciples say to him, hey, Jesus, like the last time we were in Judea, they tried to stone you. Do you remember? Like, let's not go back there. It's not the right time. And uh, Thomas is the one that says, let's go. We'll just follow Jesus and die with him there. It's like, okay, you know, it's not like um, the, the premier faith man in the team. It seems like to me, if I read just little bits of what we hear about Thomas, and here he is saying, I'm, I, just, I don't believe he's even alive. Now, the risen Lord Jesus, the one who is worthy of worship from every human being that's ever lived, the one that the stars are shining for, the one that the angels are bowing down before, he stoops down to find the doubter. Would you? He comes to find the man who's doubting. He comes to reveal himself to that individual, to give him the opportunity to believe by this physical presence of the risen Jesus. Put your faith in me, Thomas. I'm real. I'm right here. I'm risen from the dead. I think many of us would have chosen the bold and the courageous. Let's find the disciple that's most likely to change the world with his testimony. Let's find the the one that's kind of most on board, that understands more, that's been with me. Let's invest in the one that's most likely to succeed. And of course, Jesus did appear to all the disciples. And of course, he did impart a great message and a, a hope and an inspiration to them all. But here he is finding the doubter. Here he is revealing himself, making it plain that you can believe because he appeared to him. The risen Lord Jesus also appeared to Peter. John chapter 21 and verse 15. When they'd finished eating, this is on the beach, they'd be eating fish. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter will glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter had failed spectacularly. Spectacularly. On the night that Jesus was betrayed and they were talking about things and uh, Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples for his impending death and uh, Peter was the one who said, look Jesus, I'll go to prison with you and I'll even die for you. He, He vocalizes his total confidence in his ability to follow Jesus with total devotion and commitment stands out among the disciples as he makes these claims. A few hours later, Jesus is on trial and and, uh, there's this servant girl, the lowliest of girls, coming to him and saying, weren't you one with him? Weren't you one of his disciples? And he's stooped to say, look, I didn't even know the man. He's gone from total confidence to total abandonment. And after three times denying Jesus, as we know, the rooster crows and he turns and looks at Jesus and Jesus looks at him and he runs outside weeping. Here he is fishing. Resurrection has happened. Jesus is alive. Peter's fishing. He's broken. He's not the man he thought he was. And the risen Jesus comes to find him. Now, English translated of this, bar, of this text, we miss some of the nuances in the original Greek language because in Greek there's several words for love and we only have one. And in this passage, there's more than one word being used for love. There's agape love, which is this kind of total commitment love, this devotion love, this steadfast, unconditional, I am in for everything kind of love, agape love. There's filia love which is like the love you have for a friend, deep affection. I have deep affection for you. You're my friend, like Alex, my friend. Deep affection for Alex. It's a different kind of love. Nine, I think eight words for love in the Greek language, only one that we use. And so when you dig into this text in its original language, you find that Jesus is saying, Simon Peter, do you agape love me? Do you love me with total devotion and complete commitment to give your life to me in love? 
that kind of request. And Peter's answer is, I'm not that man. You know I'm not that man. Jesus, I fully love you. I love you with deep affection as a friend, but I cannot say that I agape love you. I, I, I love you with deep affection. I'm not that man. And Jesus asks him again, Peter, do you agape love me? Do you love me with deep devotion and complete commitment to give your life to me in love? Jesus, you know, I fully love you. I can't claim it anymore. I'm not that person. I love you with deep affection as a friend. And then Jesus stoops down to Peter's level and says, Peter, do you fully love me? Do you love me with deep affection as a friend? And it hurts Peter. Because it's not what he wants to be and what he should be. He says, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I fully love you. And Jesus, because he stooped down to the level of Peter, is able to say to him, Peter, one day they will take you and crucify you. Apparently upside down, that's what church history tells us. You will go somewhere you do not want to go. You will demonstrate to yourself and to the world one day your agape love of me. I've come to fetch you in your filial love. I've come to fetch you in your deep affection as a friend. But I'm telling you, follow me and you will lay down your life in total devotion and deep commitment to me as your Savior. What depth of love. What depth of love that the risen Lord Jesus, who's worthy of us just falling on our faces, is willing to stoop in his resurrected body to the level of a fallen human being, to take him from the level where he is and to show him where he's going to take him. You might love me with deep affection as a friend now, Peter, but follow me. You're going to lay down your life for me and for the kingdom. Of course, Jesus appeared to As I've said already, many of his disciples, all of his disciples, 500 people, many different ways, many different events. But here we have these three very personal encounters with Jesus. And these are the ones that I'm just highlighting and wanting to to let us rest with this morning, to process a little. Because my theory is that if Jesus did that in his resurrected body in his time, that he's willing today to meet with us where we are at in this room. And my thesis is that if Jesus is willing as, as a resurrected Lord to find people where they are, that he's willing to, in this room, find you where you are. And could be that there's someone in this room who's like Mary Magdalene and might feel unworthy, like you have no status in the kingdom of God. Might feel like you've kind of uh, come from a really broken past, You're not like a lifelong Christian. You didn't grow up in a Christian home or a Christian family. Maybe even you had some hassles with demon, uh, demonic activity. Maybe you've struggled with depression your whole life. Maybe you've sunk into the deepest pit you can imagine. And you know that people look down on you. Those around you kind of think that you're not quite with it. You're not quite there. You're not worthy in your heart and in your mind to have a relationship with the risen Lord Jesus. But if my reading of Scripture is right, then Jesus is willing to talk to Mary Magdalene as the very first witness of His resurrection, then Jesus is willing to meet you right where you are right now, today. And He's willing to lift you up out of your feeling of unworthiness and your sense of kind of abandonment or rejection or whatever it may be, and to dignify you by calling you a disciple by saying that my God and your God, my father and your father by identifying his life with your life. And if my reading of the Bible is correct, and if that is what Jesus is doing in the resurrected state, meeting with someone like Doubting Thomas, it means that he's willing to meet with a doubter here this morning. You might feel surrounded by people of such courageous faith, such bold faith, they never seem to question anything. They never have any doubts about whether God exists or why he's uh, allowing this thing or that thing to happen. But your life is just torn apart by doubt. You think, who is God and why do these things happen and why is he so, so distant from my life? And you feel like, well, I'm an outsider because I'm a doubter. But Jesus made Thomas an insider by appearing to him in that room. And he made you an insider by appearing to Thomas because it's like he was proclaiming to every future doubter. 
I'm alive and I'm showing Thomas so that you will believe. So that when you're sitting in your chair or living in your bedroom at home or praying your prayers or reading the scriptures and they don't feel alive to you and you're not sure who God is or why he's even there, that you can think back on the doubting Thomas and you can say, no, there is a man who refused to believe in the resurrected Jesus. And he changed his mind because Jesus appeared to him and he stood as a public testimony written in the scriptures and it's for me. I'm going to believe because another doubter also believed. It doesn't mean that every question will be answered. It doesn't mean that you'll understand the whole of the spiritual life. It doesn't mean that you'll never walk through a valley. But it means that he's willing to answer your doubts and to stand in, um, to, to testify that he is alive in your life. And it means that those who feel like they've failed, who let Jesus down, gave in to temptation or refused to obey something that Jesus was commanding you to do or perhaps even denied him to your friends because you didn't want to stand out as a Christian and it's just easier to say, no, like, I'm just a, you know, sometimes I go to church, but I don't know what I am really. I don't really believe. But when you got home, you just feel, oh, how did, why did I say that? Why did those words come out of my mouth and you feel like you're disqualified now? gone back fishing, just do the things that you do in life and no hope really of doing anything for Jesus, no hope really of being restored. Just feel like I've, I've just blown that one. Somehow I, I'm going to just live my life in kind of on the outskirts. But if Jesus came to Peter in his failure and if Jesus called him out of the low, if you like, response of love that he was able to give at that time, met him where he was and called him into the most exciting adventure of his whole life, serving Jesus. Surely Jesus can do the same for you. Surely Jesus can take your broken mess and restore you to relationship with him, fellowship with him, and to a journey of faith that will surprise even you. The Resurrection Sunday is about Jesus taking things that are dead and making them alive. Things that are hopeless, that seem to be just buried, that can never live again, and make them alive. Whatever that may be in your life, I believe today is an opportunity to receive that resurrection power at work in you, to walk with Jesus for eternity. Today is Resurrection Sunday, and we celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead. I want to take an opportunity to pray for us, and I want to ask if we can just bow our heads for a moment and just close our eyes and um, just take a moment to consider the message of salvation, the message of Jesus, the work of the cross, the appearance of Jesus to these three individuals and This is a once a year opportunity where we gather in this kind of way and we speak perhaps so specifically about these events and what they mean to the Christian life. And I do want to give an opportunity for anyone that wants to respond to that message, to, to be able to, uh, in a way, take a step forward in faith uh, because of this message of Jesus. And, and firstly, I, I want to pray for anyone who who wants to put their faith in Jesus, who may never have done that before. You might be here in this room and have been to a thousand services before. You may have heard the message of Jesus a thousand times, but you've never actually taken a step of faith yourself. You've never said, I believe in Jesus, and I repent of my sin, and I accept his gift of salvation in my life. And I, I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you or to ask you to do anything strange. I just would love to pray for you in the light of that if that's where you're at. And it's not your prayer that even saves you. It's your faith. It's your belief. And so if you believe you're saved, even right now. But if that's you, if there's someone here that wants to say, look, I'm putting my faith in Jesus today. Please pray for me. Why don't you just raise your hands while people have their heads bowed, their eyes are closed. No one else is worrying about you or what you're thinking. Just want to take the opportunity to pray for someone. Thank you. Thank you. There's a few people putting their hands up. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. 
Thank you. It's not. Uh, it's nothing spiritual about putting your hand up. It's nothing, you know, kind of that. Um, it's it's faith. I believe in Jesus, and that act of faith. The Bible says makes you born again, a new creature, a new appreciation for God, a new ability to relate with Him, to hear His voice, a tenderness towards Him that you've never had before. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I wonder if there are a fair number of hands that have gone up. I wonder if I can ask us just to pray together. And uh, so all of us, including those that have raised your, your hands, I'm just going to lead us in a prayer of faith, a prayer of response to God. And I would just like to ask us all to repeat after me if you can, just to walk with those who are putting their faith in Jesus today. Father, I come to you today. I put my faith in Jesus. I accept his sacrifice on my behalf. I repent of my sin. I receive your forgiveness. Make me new. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just while we keep our heads bowed, is there anyone here this morning that can relate to one of these characters that I've been talking about this morning? Mary Magdalene, unworthy, low status, Thomas the doubter, Peter the failure. And just say, Phil, I'm in that place. Please, can you pray for me today that God could work in me with his resurrection power like he appeared to these people to set me back on the journey of faith, restore me. And lead me in my life. Is there anyone that needs prayer this morning that say, I'm in that kind of place? I'd love to just pray for anyone like that today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of the scriptures and for the way in which they speak so directly to our heart and expose us for who we are. We thank you that they don't leave us exposed, but they comfort us with your power and with your comfort and your encouragement and your truth. And so, Lord, we hold on to your word today. And Lord, we say, if you're willing to meet with Mary Magdalene and Doubting Thomas and Peter that failed, we know that you're willing to meet with us. And today we ask that you work in our lives in that same powerful way. Let your resurrection power flood through our lives. Restore us where we need restoration. Lift us out of our pit where we need to be lifted up, Lord. Give us peace when we're doubting. And grant, Lord, that we might love you with that agape love, that full devotion and total commitment that you displayed when you lay down your life for us in Jesus' name. We've sung our songs. We've let the scriptures touch our hearts. We've prayed our prayers and we have one more act that we can do in worship today and that's the communion table. And uh, it's just a wonderful privilege to come to that table, to partake in the body and the blood of Christ, to remind ourselves that he broke his body, his body was broken for you and for me and his blood was spilled for you and for me. It is personal in a way as we partake of that for ourselves, but it's also communal as we partake of it together as a group of believers, a church. And it's a wonderful privilege to be able to do that.